Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 698. My guest today, Shidoshi Ron Van Cleef. Yeah. Stick around. It's an amazing episode. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean, Jeremy? Well, go to whistlekick.com and see what that means. All the stuff that we do, all the things that we're involved in, from Marshall Journal to all these other programs and, and websites that, that we run, they're all linked from whistlekick.com. So check those out, including the store. It's one of the ways that we pay the bills over here. If you find something you like, use the code podcast15. Helps us know on the back end that listeners, viewers like you are supporting what we do. If you want to go deeper on the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we post transcripts for episodes. We post all the things that won't fit in the podcast player show notes. It's all over there for every single episode we've done. And you can play the episodes right from there. You want to search for somebody from somewhere or doing something. It's a great way to find an episode that maybe strikes a, a chord for you at that particular moment. Lots of things that you can do to help us out from leaving reviews to buying books to donating to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can do as little as two bucks a month. It goes up from there. The more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give back to you. You want the whole list? Everything you can do to support us? Whistlekick.com slash family. Check that out. Today's guest probably doesn't need much of an intro for very many of you. Shidoshi Van Cleef's been around for a while and he's been doing it for a while. This, this guy is, is history. And I don't, I don't mean that in the sense that he's passed. I mean that he's been there and he's been around and he's been part of so many things with amazing people. The names that come up in this episode, unlike just about anyone we've ever had, and it's compelling and it's fun and it's, it, it's, it's a great episode. It is the episode that I hoped it would be and I hope you enjoy it. I'll see you at the outro. Hello, sir. How are you? All right. God, I, I'm so thankful you're doing this. I really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Well, um, do you want to just you want to jump in or do you want to chat for a few let's minutes? Go. All right, let's 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 do it. Um, you know, often, most of the time, when we start a show, I, I have the guests kind of introduce themselves and we start off with with a number of things like that that we don't we don't have to do here so i'm i'm kind of thrown off as the interviewer because i don't have to do part of what i often do so i'm going to fall back on something that i often start with or at least get to pretty quickly and that's why because i think why in the martial arts is a question that is not asked often enough so why did you start training I started training when I was 15 years old. I was a gymnast in boys high school in Brooklyn. And one day I was invited to the St. John's Community Center where I met Grandmaster Moses Powell. And he was, uh, he was my superhero, my Batman, my Superman, all of that. He was a lot of people's superheroes. He's an amazing, amazing man and his, uh, Martial arts prowess is uh, you know, undeniable. You know, he inspired me to really look at the martial arts from different uh, viewpoints. You know, uh, he introduced me to Grandmaster Peter Urban, who later on became my mentor in Goju and Aikijitsu. But uh, I, I studied with. Uh, Moses Powell until I went in the Marine Corps in 1960 and um, continued my martial arts education in Okinawa, mm -hmm. uh, where I studied Shurinu and Ishinu and a couple of the Wechiru Okinawan Karate Do systems. Um, did some Kobu Jitsu there. Came back uh, to the United States in 1965. Where I started uh, really maintaining my relationship with Grandmaster Peter Urban. Uh, Moses sent me to him to learn how to kick and punch. So that was a great uh, union of uh, thought. You know? mm. 
Spencer Irvin was probably my most prolific uh, teacher. He wrote a book, the Karate Dojo, which has uh, been the foundation of my martial arts uh, career. I, I met Bruce Lee in 1967. He taught me the concepts of Jeet Kune Do, which was Wing Chun at the time. Can, can I ask you a question about Bruce? Sure. Because we've had a few people on the show over the years who met Bruce Lee. And actually, I'm thinking of one particular email I received from someone who hasn't been on the show. And before Bruce Lee was Bruce Lee, it seems everyone could tell he was destined to be Bruce Lee. Was that your sense? I just thought he was a very good martial artist. Okay. He was, he was um, philosophical, which you didn't see that much of in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, we had the same sort of uh, fitness regimen. Uh, I was a gymnast uh, at, from junior high school on to college to high school. Um, we, we both believe that if you don't keep the machine together, nothing else works, no matter what the technology you, uh, you know, adhere to. Um, I like Bruce. He opened my mind to a different way of looking at martial arts. I would say that he and Sensei Urban were the most influential in my life and as far as the um, the, the mental expanse of martial arts. Um, they both allowed me to explore uh, visualization, uh, allowing me to look at uh, what was to be before it happened. Kind of sports psychology before that was really a term. Yes, and, and they both helped me develop my, my instincts and my inner uh, my inner thoughts, my inner self. Um, most martial artists that I had met until that time were more uh, involved in just the uh, physicalization of the techniques and not really the, uh, the why, how, where, when, all of that other stuff, mm. which really uh, is important because if you don't have that other stuff, no matter how good your technique is, it will never work. You know, so I've uh, never been great or good. I, I just keep uh, keep plugging on, man. You know, I, I took off my red belt when I was sixty-eight, and I put on a white belt at Nelson Gracie School here in Hawaii. Mm. It was a, a, a brilliant move, and it allowed me to get rid of a lot of stuff I didn't really need and be able to continue my workouts without getting punched and kicked in the face. Was that a difficult decision? Because no, you know, when you get older, your body hurts. There's nothing like getting kicked in the balls or punched in the face. It, <laughs> it, it doesn't really work. When you're older, your body doesn't feel as often or as well as it should or could. So I developed a lot of injuries over 65 years of karate competition. Mm. Over 900 tournaments I participated in. So I had, wow. I had a lot of injuries. A lot so of I started uh, studying jiu-jitsu when I was 68. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I realized the injuries were 1% of what I got in karate or kung fu or whatever. And you know, once you know how to punch and kick and stuff, you don't really need to practice it. You just need to keep your body in the proper shape so that you can do those things. Mm. I thought that after 60 years in martial arts, that uh, I was negligent in my ground game. I realized that when I fought Horace Gracie at UFC 4, I was 51, he was 26. So I decided to go into it. Everyone thought I was, had lost my mind. But if you don't challenge yourself, how can you grow? Right. You can't grow. And so since the UFC, I've had an interest in the Machados, uh, Joe Moreira, 
Enzo Gracie. I, I've had several mentors, but I've been um, really concentrating for the past 11 years with Elson Gracie and Professor Ron Shiraki here in Hawaii at the Ron Shiraki Academy. And I started competing when I was 74. So I've competed about a dozen times. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Now, as, as someone who has competed extensively at a very high level for a very long time, coupled with your statement that, let's say, the body is changing. Let's, let's sum it oh, up yeah. there. For sure. What Anybody can do jujitsu. Anybody can't do karate. Okay. So when, when, you go in, when you go in competing in jujitsu, what, is there a goal? Is your goal to win? I mean, you're obviously, you, you've got a history as a fierce competitor. Does that shut off? I don't know if it is to win. Okay. Um, to me, jujitsu is survival. Hmm. Um, for me, I put about eight years in defense only in the jujitsu. For the past four years, I've cross trained and added submissions and aggressive technology to my arsenal. Um, firstly, you don't want to get hurt. It's easy to get hurt in jujitsu. I had five ribs broken, I bit through my tongue, I had nine stitches in my tongue. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can be injured in jujitsu, but it's not the same thing. You know? um, I'm enjoying the experience more so than I ever enjoyed any martial arts experience that I can remember. That that's a wow. Yeah. Okay. The, going to the Nelson Gracie Academy allows me to it's the highlight of my day. I would probably go crazy if I didn't have that training a couple of times a week. Hmm. I only go two, three times a week, but when I go, I always get four or five rounds of six minute round sparring and all the guys are young, they're in their twenties and thirties. So it's beautiful, you know? And I've been like the, the dojo choking dummy for about six years. <laughs> I'm now starting to reverse that. I was able to submit one of the purple belts that has been dogging me for three years or four years. I finally submitted him three times in one night. I, I, I went home, I was extremely happy. You know, extremely. I'm now submitting uh, the blue belt. It was always easy to submit the white belts. They just spaz out. They try to, the prowl, you know, they try to pressure you out. And that, yep. that's too easy to get away from. But uh, the, the purples and the browns and the blacks are so technically at that. They're so, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful art. There is no one art that's the everything, the, the, the cure all. I believe if you balance your training between stand-up game and ground game, you become more of a balanced, rounded um, fighter mm -hmm. or, or a student. I, I prefer a student than fighter. Okay. Um, I'm really enjoying the competing. I, of course, I want to win. I always try my best. Before the pandemic, I fought at the Worlds in Las Vegas. I lost my second match. But the guy I lost to won the whole deal for the day. So I felt really, really fucking good. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it, it took him, um, he only won by two points. So it's not like it was a big, a big win or what he didn't submit. It, was, it came out to a uh, decision. You know? But I'm going to compete next month. And at 79, I'm going into the 185 pound purple belt division. And there's nobody near my age in that. There, there's no age brackets on this. Ever. You know, they have a over, they have a 50 bracket. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen anybody in that bracket. I went so to you'd rather show up and, I, and get into it. I'd rather go to whatever weight division and color built division I fall into mm -hmm. than to think about the age differential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wind up going in with these twenty-year-old guys, and they're great because that's who I roll with the, in the dojo every night. Anyway, 
Yeah. So to me, uh, I'm disappointed in that I never see anybody over 50 actually uh, rolling on the mats. Why do you think that is? I, and this is my own personal opinion. Yeah. It's either injuries or laziness. Mm. It can only be those two things. I mean, I have a lot of injuries. You know, I have a shoulder replacement. I've had, I've had a bunch of injuries, you know. But I can't stop until I get what I want from this. And what I want from this is to balance my whole mental, physical, spiritual uh, essence into one uh, malleable, uh, useful instrument for me to make my life better. And that. it's really simple, you know. You use the word technology a couple of times. I've never heard anyone use that term in the context of martial arts. What do you What do you mean when you say technology? Well, technology is it's the technique that you use, not just the, the the physical technique, but the mental technique that gives you the physical technique. Example: uh, When you go to a match, you immediately want to take the person down and submit them. I mean, that's what sure. you know. Guys go right out, they drop, they drop the queen in their guard, they go for some, some takedown or some something, and they try to finish you off. The concept is real that you make contact, you close the gap, you take the person down, you put them in a position where they either spaz out or panic out and they give you a limb and you submit that limb. It's a real simple, it's a progression. It's it's not even. It's, it's like chess. Mm. Pawns move out, bishops move out, rooks move out, and you set a plan. It took me at least 10 years to be able to get a plan because I had not enough technical uh, knowledge to string movements together. And that's what I was saying about the mental part. Mm. If you cannot visualize before you do it, you're not going to do it because it takes thousands of reps in order to condition your body to do this stuff without thinking about it. And that's what's happening now with me. After 11 years on the mat, these big guys jump me and they take me down and they pressure, try to pressure pass and I just relax, let them burn out. Eventually, they're going to give me something. They're going to be off balance. They're going to give me a limb. They're going to let me get a grip in. Something is going to happen. And I'm going to be able to take advantage of it, or I shrimp out. I just get out of it, go out the back door, or, or, or whatever. So it's it's a lot different from karate. A guy goes in, he punches you in the face, or kicks you in the balls. That's that's the end of the story, you know. But with this, the control, the ability of control, is the most that I've ever seen in any art, like judo, similar to aikido but very close in as far as you have inches to move in, not feet, you know? And the, what I love about the jujitsu guys is that they, they're not afraid of getting hit. What they, they want you to throw something, so they'll do something like this, so you hit this, then they can grab a limb. Once they right. grab, you know, they go for the, for the uh, you know, take you right down. You know, I mean, it's it's simple. They go to the clinch. Once they go to the clinch, you are going down. If you don't know what's happening at that point, you're submitted. You're choked out, arm bar, triangle, kimura, I mean, omoplata. I mean, they got a dozen things they can do on the on the way down. You know, so I'm I'm really really enjoying it. It is truly the highlight of my day. That's awesome. And I go even when I don't feel like it. My body is hurting. Like I went to the gym the, the, the day before, and it takes a day to recover from the gym or the jujitsu for me now. Because when I go, I put 110% out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Normally, when I leave the jujitsu school, if I don't hold on to the banister, I will definitely pass out and fall down the stairs because I have nothing left. That's how hard you go, even I, still. I always give myself at least five rounds of sparring. 
sometimes on the way out the door, I'm barely making it out the door. And a brown belt or a black girl say, you got one more? And I said, sure. I just jump right back on the mat and I, and I give them one more. But I'm always exhausted at the class. Always. Look like I just got out of the shower, sweating for 35 minutes after. Yeah. But it's some, an amazing, amazing thing. Was that always your approach to training? To make sure you leave with the tank empty? Yeah. 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 What's the reason to come if you're not gonna empty the tank? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Now is that has that been your your philosophy to life with everything, or is that something to that Grandmaster Powell to, put in to, to you or to life? Yeah. If you're gonna do it, do it right. Napoleon Hill thinking that kind of stuff, you know. Um I just learned that martial arts isn't just a striking and kicking and punching. It, it's it's a form of life. It's it's a way of living. It, it's a it's a lifestyle. It isn't just a, a technology for self defense. It, it, and self defense to me isn't punching and kicking. It's doing the best for yourself, making every day a learning experience. You know, that's what self defense is for me. Making yourself better in every way, every day. It's pretty simple. Life I agree. Is, as you get older, I'm going to be 80 next year. We don't waste any more time on bullshit. No more time in negative thinking. None wasted time. You know? We just try to think the best that we can. Help everybody in our circle. How to, um, if you make yourself better, you make your community better. You make the world better. All of that is, we're all linked in. People don't realize that we're all linked in. So I'm going to jujitsu tonight. I'm exhausted. I'm jet lagged from the, the Hall of Fame. I was in uh, New Jersey, New Jersey, um, Jesus, Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. with Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, he was, uh, Dr. Bob Goldman. Mm -hmm. I was inducted into the International Sports. Hall of Fame. Congratulations. It was really too much. You know, I mean, those things make me very nervous, uh, giving acceptance speeches and all that stuff. And the, the, the list of honorees is just you know, mind boggling that I'm accepted into that circle. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of surreal, mm. you know? but uh, it was a wonderful experience. My wife went with me. She was happy, so yeah, good. What do you take from your your karate, your prior training? What have you brought from that that's been an asset into jujitsu? Only the mental stuff. Only the mental stuff. Never quit. Keep going. Explore your um, your opponent's weaknesses. Uh, exceed your your, your limits. Mm -hmm. You know, um, constant pressure, soft and hard technology. Um, very little from the physical point of view from karate has helped me um, in jiu-jitsu. I was always a physical fitness person. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I won the push-up record for two minutes, 257 push-ups. It wasn't, it wasn't broken for about eight to 10 years record um of course it's easy when your drill instructor has a 45 against your head you can do 300 push-ups and that's what <laughs> that's what <laughs> he said nigga if you stop i'll kill you so that was it you know i came up through a very uh, difficult time in american history you know i was stationed in the marine corps in 1960 i was lynched by the ku klux klan in 1963 in kingston north carolina spent three months in the hospital broke my jaw Knocked out ten teeth, almost lost my left eye. It was bad times, you know. There were there were very bad times for for black people for not uh, drinking out of a faucet that said uh, black only, you know. So, yeah, I've seen I've seen the good and the bad in my life, and all of it really is determined by how I think about myself. 
how I think about the self is how you think about the world. If you have confidence in yourself, you have confidence that you'll be able to exist and expand your knowledge in this world. And, and fear is the killer. Fear is hate. If, if you fear anything, you're in trouble. You know? You're not you afraid of anything? To... No. Nothing. I've been shot, I've been stabbed, I've had all of those things happen. Shot, stabbed, and lynched. What would I be afraid of? <laughs> nothing. And you're still here. I guess nothing, and, and nothing's I'm still left. Here. I have a great wife, I have beautiful kids, great grandkids. Life is good, you know, and I've been through hell. I guess anybody that reached 79 years old has seen a lot of bullshit in their lives. Bosses, just all kinds of insane stuff. Death, friends, family. My mother and father both passed away. My brother was killed in Vietnam. So I, you see a lot of stuff. So many of my friends have died in the past year, martial arts icons. It's just, uh, it's very, very sad. Yeah. Very sad. So we've, we've lost some wonderful Wall, people in the last year, for sure. Bob Wall, so many. Gary Monk, all my buddies, you know, Nico Guy. <laughs> they were all giants. I lived in the age of giants. You heard the Bulls Cloud, a lot of that. And the list goes on and on and on and on. One day I'll be on that list, you know. Someone will say, "Yeah, that fucking gameplay is too much, right?" Right. No. I think for quite a few folks, sir, you are you are already on that list. Oh no. <laughs> you 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 don't have to put yourself there, but you, you can't know, live down your past, huh? You can't you can't stop them. I, I want I want to talk about the giants. You know, you, you you phrased it that way, and I think that's a good way good way to put it. You know, when we look at martial arts, when we look at the world of martial arts, when we think about who do we look up to, it's folks of your generation. We don't have people. That's because they were the pioneers. If it were not for those guys, and I'm not one of those guys, I'm in the generation after those guys. Okay. The, the, the Moses Powell, the Peter Urban, the Ronald Duncan, uh, the Ed Parkers, that crew was the first crew. The Gary Alexanders, sure. the Pete Seringanos, they were the first generation. We're in the next generation. Although we did help in the 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 um, the spreading of, of the word. Yes. They brought the word here. Gary Alexander brought Okinawa Karate here. Mm -hmm. Ed Parker brought Kempo Karate here. Peter Urban brought Goju here. So they were the roots of martial arts in America. I'm part of the, the fruit. But I would say that your group is better known than their group. You know, if I, if I imagine the people listening to, us, to this right now, yes. far more people know your name than Peter Urban. I know, it's very sad. It's very sad they don't know the history. History is important. If you don't know history, you don't know why you know what you think you know. Hmm. Okay. I'm thinking about how to ask this. No, I'll just I'll just take it head on. Please. There's a lot of finger pointing internally in the martial arts. It's been there from from what I can see, it's been there forever. Day one. Is there a way that we all do what we do without it? Can it, can martial arts exist it without that? It can exist, but it can't. It's, it's the way people think today. You know, the, the cancer culture. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening now that's really sad. Uh, critical race theory. That, that's just American history. There's so much bullshit now. I don't want to get into politics or anything, but the system that we're living in could be better for regular people. That's all I'm going to say. It should be better for regular people. 
It should not just be for the elite. Um, that's why the martial arts are so wonderful. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or a person that lives on the streets. And I've had both as students. Hmm. Both. Once they understand the capacity that they have, they change. They change. And to, and to see that change, it's quite beautiful. You know? They open up to the possibilities of life. You know, like billionaires. I've had a couple of those as clients. They're bored to death, man. They got all the toys, they got all the cash, they got everything. The women, they have everything you think that you want if you become rich. And they're bored to death. Because what's motivating them? Because there's nothing substantial yeah. in their lives. You know, money's cool. I've been there, done that. It's, it's a great thing. But it's not everything. I have friends that think if you don't, if you're not a millionaire, you're a bum. Can you imagine? That you're a bum, not just you're, you're just a regular guy, that you're a bum. Wow. It's kind of lethal, you know? And then I have friends that when they had the stock market crash, they lost a hundred million dollars and they were ready to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. It's insane. You know, the world that we're living in, that's why martial arts are so beautiful. It gives you the power, the power from within to withstand all of the pressure and all of the obstacles and challenges in front of you. That's what martial arts is. It's a people builder. It allows you, if you let it, to build yourself and not just your physical capacity. Sure. Because martial arts is only 10% physical. It's 90% mental. I, I'm right there with you. I fully agree. I, I, you know, we often on this show through conversation, through our topic episodes, espouse the non-physical virtues and especially the non-combative aspects oh, yeah. of martial arts. But when, when you start, when you were coming up, did people talk about that? No. When did well, that start? Talking, that was Peter Urban. Okay. Everybody else had just killed those fuckers. You know what I mean? <laughs> kill, them, kill them all. And so what was he saying that was a counter message to that? Yeah. How so? What, what was Peter Urban? You, you said he was the first one that you heard really say that. So who? His first thing is, he would say, defeat the self first to know. So you have to think about that in order to understand it. And it takes years to, to understand those type of uh, kohans. Okay. Um, to defeat yourself means you have to understand yourself from a, from a realistic viewpoint, not one of those, well, I'm okay, but I... No, you have to be real and upfront, 100% with no chaser who you are, what you are, why you are, what you are, and where you're going from there. That was Cynthia Urban. This whole thing was based on the thought process of how you got from here to there, which was your martial arts life and your real life in one, in one cosmos. It was quite brilliant. If you ever get a chance to read the Karate Dojo by Peter Urban, it is an amazing thesis on the, the mental uh, aspects of mental spiritual aspects of martial arts. You're saying it here. Everything I've read about him, I have not read that book, but the mm -hmm. the accounts that I've read of him, everyone says he was decades ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time. Way, 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 way ahead of his time. Brilliant man. Brilliant man. I, I lived with him for three years in Chinatown in a dojo that we shared together. And um, some of the best times of my life. I mm -hmm. playing chess with him, watching him play Chopin on his piano. You know? yeah. any, any stories from that time that you're willing oh, to share? Sure. Bruce Lee came down to our, our down the Center Urban School and he was sitting there. He's playing chess with Bruce and we're smoking weed. We're just chilling, you know? And uh, 
just listening to them expounds their their uh, psychophysical um, doctrines. You know, they, they both were philosoph philosophic in their basic um, thought pattern of martial arts. Mm -hmm. They thought of the higher realm of martial arts education beyond the technical aspect. And that was a beautiful thing to, to witness, you know? And if it were not for that type of uh, influence from either Irving, Ed Parker, Leon Ting, I've had a, uh, Leo Fong, I've had so many great mentors that were able to transfer that type of knowledge to me. I'm just sorry I wasn't open enough during those years to be able to understand and appreciate that knowledge. That really? Took years later. Yeah, of course. W were you were you not open or not ready? Um, I was open but not ready when I came. Back I, I think from, it's a big difference. Yeah, when I came back from Vietnam uh, after my service in the Marine Corps, I was not as open-minded as I had been previously. Ah. And so it did change my way of um, dealing with life, uh, PTSD, or whatever, whatever. Um, yeah, it changed. It changed a great deal. Mm -hmm. And it's taken years to get back to not yet fully, but to get to get back on the right path. And so you know, I started writing, um, I'm finishing the book called Zentences. It's the layman's guide to Zen psychotherapy. I'm about uh, one week from finishing it, you know. Zen psychotherapy. Can you define that for us? That's not a term I'm familiar with. Ah, well, the whole concept of Zen is the, the spiritual, mental um, coordination of, of your, your, your mindset. A Zen psychotherapist is a person that uses Zen principles and thought patterns to develop your mental, physical, and spiritual essence during this like cycle. Okay. The, the essence of, like you, you take Zen is, uh, since everyone would give me the first one, let's go. Now what does let's go mean? It means let's go. Keep going. There is nothing else. Let's go is the flame, the spark that flame, the flame for your essence of your life. And so things like that. Let's go. Keep going. There is nothing else. And then next. So it, it, it is a circle of mental, spiritual, and physical continuity that allows you to adhere to basic Zen principles to develop the right mindset to live in the world today. That's an encyclopedia. So I've this been sounds like this book white about this. Oh, yeah. You know, I've, I, <laughs> because of my PTSD and my dementia, right, I've rewritten this book four times. <laughs> so now my latest version is, it's almost like a picture book with these sentences at the bottom or in the in the frame of the picture with a um, with a space open for a person to give their definition of what that sentence meant to them. Mm. It's it's almost like a workbook. Yeah. It it, yeah. So, it sounds like um, longtime listeners know my my affinity for Joe Hyam's book. Zen and the martial oh, arts. Oh, I knew Joe. I, I, I'm, oh. That doesn't surprise me. But what you're that. describing sounds like a continuation of that sort of concept and that approach. Anybody yes. who's read that book knows it's, yeah, exactly. it's short and, and it's, it's very digestible and yeah. actionable. Yes. Yeah. How did you meet that Joe? <laughs> How did you meet Joe Himes? I met Joe Hines and Bruce Lee okay. back in the either mid 60s or late 60s. 
at uh, Ed Parker's International um, Tournament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went there to, to fight. You know, I, I used to go to the tournaments all the time. And I lost to uh, Steve Muhammad. You know Steve Muhammad? I know that name. Steve Muhammad is a um, ex-Marine, former uh, law enforcement uh, officer in uh, California. Kempo stylist under uh, Ed Parker. Bruce told me he had the fastest hands he had ever seen. So that's a record. That's, that's quite, yeah, that's quite the quite the thing like that. Statement. You know, and so I lost to him in the eliminations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, years later, I said, you remember that day? He said, oh, no, I don't remember that. I, <laughs> that was my thing. Uh, And Steve is older than me. Steve is probably 83 years old. And still looking really good. Technique is phenomenal. You stay in touch. Yeah. Do you stay in touch with many, many folks from, from your the ones that are still alive. So many have died yeah. in these past couple of years. Um, I was supposed to do a film with Leo Fong. He just passed away. And he had just sent me the script. Mm. It's one of those zombie movies called this. Savage Seven, and uh, you know he just passed away like a week or so ago. Yeah, it's just sad that uh, I worked on two films with Leo in uh, the Philippines. He's a great guy, a really great guy. He broke my nose in the hotel. <laughs> hey, you got... <laughs> but, you know, okay, we're <laughs> okay. this We were getting ready to go to the set. And Good. Darnell Garcia and I were sparring in the hotel. Leo said, no, 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 do it this way. And he and hit me in the nose, he broke my nose. <laughs> and this is on the way to the set, right? And so I'm like, I'm in super pain. I straightened it out myself. You know what I mean? The blood is pouring out of my nose. I got uh, toothpicks with the uh, toilet paper right in my nose. Yep. And I go to the set and I'm trying to stop the bleeding so I can do the scene. <laughs> Oh, what a riot. Gosh. But I think anytime somebody can say, what was the first sentence? Like, he was a great guy. He broke my nose. You know, that that is that is true friendship. He was right a there. great man. He was my mentor. Yeah. Leo Fong lived to like 93 years old. Mm. I was working out every day. His chi sao and stuff was magnificent. Very clean, very sharp, very sensitive, very, you know, yeah. Wow. So it's just sad to see so many pass. That's part of why we do what we do, because I wanna I wanna talk to everybody. I wanna record yeah, these before conversations you go, right? these stories. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you think back on your, your competitive time, I'm sure people have asked you, you know, who was the toughest component opponent or who was the most memorable fighter who was your favorite person who was the one that you knew when they were across from you it was yeah it was probably going to be a rough fight but you were going to have a great time so many of those you know so many of those uh, starting with louis delgado mm -hmm. he was an amazing fighter you know i i introduced him to bruce lee had him he chose all American championship and they became friends and Louis moved out to California and trained with Bruce extensively at his house and everything, you know. Um, Louis was a great fighter. I saw all three fights he had with Chuck Norris, you know. Louis was a brilliant fighter. Chuck was a brilliant fighter, you know. Chuck was a brilliant fighter. Do, do you think people don't give him enough credit for his competitive days? Well, I give him credit for his competitive days because I was around to see him right. personally. But people that were not around during that time, he didn't compete for a long time. He probably competed for about six years, uh, intense, you know? But he was, he was a smart fighter. He was always fit, fearless. You know, you got to, you got, can't forget that one. He was a technician. He was a smart fighter. He was a really good counter fighter. Really good counter fighter. 
them. He would make you attack so he could count them. He was smart, good fighter. You know, then and Joe Lewis, mm. he was a great fighter, someone I enjoyed sparring with. Um, there were just so many good guys there. There was a, a, a gentleman by the name of William Oliver. What an amazing from the Kyokushin guy from Masuyama's system. Little little guy like five foot six beat everybody. Went to Japan, beat everybody, no matter what weight. Um, he passed away already, but he was an amazing, amazing fighter. What, what made him? You're you're talking about some of these guys. You know, you talked about Chuck as being a a very smart fighter. What made this gentleman such a good William fighter? Oliver was, I'd say, five six. Uh-huh. Uh, hit like he was two twenty five. <laughs> Extreme, that sounds like Kyokushin. Extremely fast. Um, unbelievable leg flexibility. Mm. Uh, could kick real hard to the head uh, with multiple kicks. Wow. I have punched him in the chest, knocked him down. He'd get up and round kick me right in the ribcage. <laughs> A brilliant, brilliant fighter. You know? And I'm 190 pounds. When I was at my best, I was 185. But he was 130 pounds. Then there was Joe Hayes, another amazing Taekwondo guy. No, Mudokwan, an amazing kicker. He was the guy that beat me the day that Bruce Lee named me the Black Dragon. I lost my finals grand championship match to Joe Hayes at the All-American Championship. Bruce was sitting ringside. When I came out, he says, damn, you're the Black Dragon. He said, what? I lost. He said, no, no, you're the Black Dragon. It's what I saw in you when you were fighting. Didn't matter whether you lost or won. I saw that spirit. And then we became friends. We went back to the hotel, smoked some weed, hung out for a few hours. You know. He was a very down-to-earth guy. Lots of people thought Bruce had an attitude, like ego, this and that. He knew what he knew, and he didn't care what he thought. Hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. And I don't equate that with one having an ego. Um, that means he was aware of himself, he knew himself, and he didn't have to explain himself or impart uh, bullshit that uh, he wasn't interested in. I mean, I'm with that. Yeah. You know, the less you say on that, the better. Following his own path doesn't care if you think it's the right path. It was his path, his choice. Your opinion on it's irrelevant. Yeah, Bruce introduced me to Steve McQueen, and then he introduced me to um, our <laughs> man Flint. Kisaka. He's done a, he's done a lot of film. James Coburn. Okay. What a nice man. What a really nice man. He had arthritis so bad in his fingers. We did Chisau and he used to hurt his hands. You know, his fingers were always pain and pain. You know? But a really nice man and very motivated, you know. Very, very motivated. Tall skinny guy, you know. Flexible. Interesting. You know, the, the times that uh, I had the occasion to, to speak with Bruce were, were important in that we thought on the same level of martial arts. We believed there was a, a mental, physical, spiritual uh, collaboration that, that unless you were in touch with all three of those factors, you weren't really um, balanced. You weren't really um, training properly, you know. When I started studying martial arts, those conversations never even happened. This is a punch. It's a kick. This is how you do it. So, you know, and, and people like Bruce, people like Ed Parker, Peter Irvin, Moses Powell, they got into the 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 essence of these different parts. And it didn't matter whether it was a psychophysical aspect or just a s- structural, um, tangible 
sensitive part. You know, they they were able to impart this ability for you to become inquisitive, mm -hmm. to be able to question these different techniques. How does it work with the, if I was small, if I was taller? You know, I mean, all techniques have to be adapted to the person that is using them anyway. All of them. There's none of them. No one can do the same punch the same way exactly. It's, it's impossible. We're different. Everybody's completely different. Each, you know, and, and how we interpret things is different. We can all say, yeah, this is a sun fist, but there's a lot to that, you know. Um, I've always been one to want to find the easiest way to accomplish a mission. And I found in life there is no easy way <laughs> in that you have to put in the work, you have to put in the time. I mean, I put 11 years in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I'm a perfect buff. I feel great that I was able to get this far. I mean, I started at 68 years old. Everybody on the mat was 20, you know? And you know how spastic white belts are, they try to kill me. For a few years, I was like a choking dummy, you know? I said, well, did, did they really even try to kill you? Oh my goodness. Really? Did they know who you were? There, there were times where I couldn't swallow food after I left the dojo, that's how they had my neck and throat ah. hurt from everyone choking. You say, come on, let's stand up and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll even this out. There is none of that in the dojo. I you know, know, I almost I got know. thrown out of uh, Ron Chiraki's dojo because I accidentally palmed one guy in the face. And then I actually hit a guy with an elbow when they had, when he mounted me, you know, just instinctively. Yeah. You know, oh. And uh, I got thrown out of the dojo twice and if it were one more time, that was it. Ooh. So I had to learn how to control the instinct, not the technique, the instinct of. The thing that you had trained for so yeah. long, you had to untrain a bit. Wow, wow. But now I'm, I'm actually comfortable on the body. Hmm. I'm actually comfortable with someone on top of me, either mounted or side control or whatever. I'm actually comfortable. It took a long time. Okay. You didn't know what it's like for someone to sit on your chest trying to get your wrist or your arm to armbar you or something. It's not a nice feeling at all. You know? <laughs> Going for your neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's. But now, it, it doesn't matter what they do. You know, I, I learned, uh, you know, in, in truth, it's grips. If you grab a wrist or an arm and a leg, they can't submit you because they don't have enough um, utensils. I've heard Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, described as a puzzle. That For if sure. You, you get to a certain point and it's, it's a puzzle because, especially, people are, are roughly similar in skill and they're not trying to smash each other. Yeah, yeah. You've got that time and you're like, okay, they're there and they're there. And how do, okay, and I wanna. And, and I find that part of it fascinating. I've, I've done I've done just enough to know I know nothing. Oh, well, I've been there 11 years and I know nothing. It's uh, Well, I know less than that. Yeah. Much less than that. It's, it's fascinating. You know, if I physically had to fight most of the guys that uh, submit me in class, I would beat them all. Yeah. Because none of them are used to getting hit, first of all. 95% mm. of them have no blocking system. Their best bet is to clinch and take you down. Well, if you hit them and kick them and punch them and things like that, before it gets to that point, you stand a really good chance of not going down. Sure. You know, a really good. And what I did for my first three years was mm. learn how to not get taken down. Get those hips away, get those legs out of there, you know. The concept is pretty easy to understand. The ability to use those concepts while you're in sparring is a different story. 
you've got someone pressuring you, you, you feel their strength, you feel their energy, you feel their chi. They may be attacking your bad wrist or attacking your knee or something. And this is a lot of fun psychological stuff going through your head when you explain. Not like in karate, you kick, punch, whatever, you just make that move, you fake him, he, he goes to the fake, you punch him in the face, he's done. It's not that way in jiu-jitsu. Everything is done to get you close enough to make contact, to uh, put you in a position that you find uncomfortable. When you get too uncomfortable, you can spaz out or panic out, you're going to give them something, whether it's arm, neck, back, whatever, they're going to take advantage of that, and they're going to submit you. I mean, it's a really, really, really simple concept. Sure. Yeah. Do, and do you think not, you... Go ahead. There are not that many techniques. I'd say there are about 24 techniques that you just use as an alphabet. You develop your uh, fluency. Hmm. Technical fluency, that's what I call it. Do you think you would have appreciated it as much if you'd started it younger? True. Sure. Not really sure because I was in the rock and sockum stage right. of my life. Um, but now I understand that, and this is only my opinion, I would have been very good at this because I like it. I, I really like the close contact. I, I really like the ability to be right there in your face, making moves. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's the Survival of the fittest mind that does it. That chest that you do to get to those positions is the fascinating part. Of that. We do drills in Jiu Jitsu where the class starts your early in the person's guard. Oh shit, here we go. You gotta pass that guard first off. You gotta pass it in order to do something. And lots of guys get stuck. <laughs> Guys, when I first started, I would get caught in a guy's guard, and it would take me, let's say, about a minute to get out. Hmm. That's way too long to be efficient, you know, mm -hmm. or effective. Way too long. And now, when people put me in the guard, I'm out in two seconds. Yeah, I'm out in two seconds. I climb right through the middle, so pressuring down, put that arm in the sleeve and the collar. Take that step around, done. You know, Tori go pass. I mean, there's, there's so many ways to pass the guard now that uh, the guard no longer represents a problem to me. Mm -hmm. I'm now trying to string techniques together so that if I go for on bar, you, you defend it. What, what do I do next? I want to be able to automatically go to the next, the next, the next. You know, I watch, I watch my, my, my teacher, Elsa Briggs. He's 67 years old. I watch him roll, you know, we, we roll by, by lines, you know. I watch him go down the line and submit 20 fucking guys in a row, man, in like six seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, you know, they're all trying really hard because they just saw the last guy get fucking choked, you know? <laughs> Excuse my language. But he just goes down the line and he's not even sweating. <laughs> I'm like that good. three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> you always told me, you know, slow down. You don't need as much fat. You know, use your grips. Relax. Breathe. It took 11 minutes for me to understand this. I rolled with, I had a rolling partner. He hasn't trained in about a year since the pandemic. His name was Alejandro. He's 340 pounds at six foot nine. It's a very large person. This is the guy that broke my rib cage. Okay. Broke five ribs and maybe five to the team. But we, we're the best, the best, the best, the best of friends. I've rolled with that guy well over a hundred times. Hmm. Mm -hmm. He's so tough that when I put a, a guillotine on or something, I can't finish him. And I got it sunk in really deep because he has a 25 inch neck. <laughs> <laughs> My fingers hurt from the gable grip holding that, trying to finish the choke. I had him in a guillotine one day and he picked me up like a piece of garbage and threw me on the mat. My back hurt for months. You hear me? My back hurt 
for months, not weeks, months, at least six months. It's sensitive. My hip joint, my. But he's not giving it to you. He's making you work for it. And I'm sure you, that's why you like him. We made Purple Belt together. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. He, he hasn't been to training in about a year now, maybe a year and a half. And I miss him because whenever he was there, he'd be the first person I'd run to, mm. to roll with. Because he was always a challenge, you know, six foot nine, three forty. You know, the lever the leverage against that is a little different than anybody else, isn't it? The important part was he started jujitsu when he was eleven. He was only thirty five years old. Mm. He started jujitsu with Helsin when he was eleven to thirty five years old. You know how much training that is? A lot. And we're the same, right? We're both purple belt together. Very strong. Once he puts you in like uh, side control or he mounts you, mm. you're going to need a crane or a derrick to get out of that. Yeah. You don't need any room. If you do breathe, there's no more breath coming in after that one breath. You know what I'm saying? And there were so many weeds. They're really, really good. I mean, not just big, they're good. And the black was Kalani. He's like a gorilla. He's like 260. Mm. You know, he had me in side control the other night, and he just jumped to the other side and jumped to the other side by using his hands. He did a handstand on my chest to get on the other side of me twice. Wow. You know, that's that is athletic and, and sounds unpleasant to be on the receiving end of your, your chest hurts. You can't breathe. No doubt. It's, it's, it's torture, you know, mm -hmm. but I go to him whenever I see him. I said, can I get one? Said, sure. Come on. He said, since I've been there, I'm, I'm, I'm inspiring. I'd be inspired if one day I can submit him at least one. <laughs> there's so many good guys there. And it's great. You know, so I mean, it should be. It's, it's a wonderful. I don't know how people cannot do something like martial arts for themselves. It's totally for you. It's yeah. for your brain. It's for your spirit. It's for your heart. It's for everything. Well, it came back. You, you had two reasons before. Fear and laziness. I think for most people, they're afraid. Yeah. And that's okay. Them. And we just, as an industry, need to be better about letting them know, hey, it's okay to be afraid. Give it a shot anyway. Yeah. Yeah. My first two years of jujitsu was hell. My, throat, my neck was sore all the time. Everybody was doing triangles and all kinds of stuff. Every, every fucking white belt. They weren't man. taking it easy on you. And, and my sensei, uh, Ron Shiraki, would always put me with the tough guys. You know? That's great. So, you know, when I made my, my uh, blue belt, they make you go through the gauntlet on your hands and knees, and you got like 40 guys whipping you with their belt. Mm -hmm. and you got your bad skin. You know? And I had whelps. Really bad. One guy hit me on the side of my neck, had a big whelp on oh. I hated going to Purple Belt because he knew. <laughs> and then House of Gracie said to me, no, you don't have to do that. I said, look, what is it if I don't do what everybody else does? I don't want any special treatment because I'm an old guy. You mean I can't get on my knees and have the guys with me forward and back like they do everybody else? Fuck no. I got to do it. I have to do the whole thing exactly the way everyone else does. I don't want any break. At all, you know. I mean, you know, you know what I mean, right? I do. I'm, I'm like everyone else, man. I don't don't call me grandmaster. Some of them call me grandmaster. I'm just Ron, Ron the purple belt. Let's roll, right? Yeah. Beautiful. So let's let go back to that book for a minute. So you said you've got about a week left on it. Is there is there a plan for when that'll come out? It's going to be out next month. Oh, okay. Yeah, I already have an editor, and I'm. I'm I'm just repositioning some things. A couple of pictures I didn't like how, how the final came out. So I'm just going to 
change that picture with something else, maybe about a dozen of those. So it's about maybe 100 sentences, each with a picture, mm -hmm. with an explanation, space, for whoever reads it to give their interpretation of the work that that's meant to them. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to have the, the workbook aspect of it because most don't. You read something and, you know, in your mind you may think, how does that pertain to what I'm thinking about? So this way, it allows you to put that thought down where you can actually see what you think. And once you can visualize your thoughts, I think it's 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 it's, it's more uh, it's it's important that we see because we're from a seeing hearing system. It's important that you see these things. Yeah, you can you can interpret yourself better to yourself. So that's why I decided to write. Is this your first book? This is my eleventh book. You're, okay. I, I wrote my first book in 1980, 1980, and it was the uh, textbook for the Secret Service. I was uh, the um, senior combatives instructor for the Secret Service from 1983 to 1993 at the World Trade Center. I trained 10,000 agents there. What was that like? That was fascinating. Because the fascinating. objective is so different, so specific. Yeah. Fascinating. It was... Uh, it was a really good job. I got some really nice letters from the president and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And directly to see the team. It was, it was a good gig. You know, um, I left in 93 after they had the, the first bombing in the World Trade Center garage. Mm -hmm. said, and I used to park there all the time. I said, you know, mm -hmm. I've been here 10 years. I think you're good. You know? And right after that, boom, the World Trade Center went down. I don't know how many hundreds of times I went in that building, you know, with my troops and my tea over my shoulder, you know, going up to the gym to teach the guys, you know? Mm. But I have to, uh, I got to get moving. I got yeah, to yeah, I, I was about ready to, to start winding out. Do we have a couple more minutes to close up? We got back last night uh, and my wife had to pack and go to California on another gig that she's doing. Okay. So I didn't even have a good chance to spend the night with my wife and no. you know? well um then let, let me just say thank you. Um how can my people pleasure. how can people stay in touch with you? Um well yeah uh, my email Ron Van Cleef at yahoo.com okay. or either one of my websites uh, blackdragonfan.com or ronvancleef.com. Okay. Either way I'm on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. So, okay. And final words for the listeners. Exceed your limits. Do the best that you can in this life because you know what? You don't get a second chance. Let's go. Keep going. And there is nothing else. Peter Urban, 1956. And thank you so very much. Shidoshi, thanks for coming on. Thanks for an utterly amazing episode. I really appreciate it all that you have done and all that you are doing it means the world to me. And I find it incredibly inspiring. Listeners, viewers, I've got a feeling you're in the same boat that you found some power in this episode. Hope you took some good stuff from it. If you wanna go deeper on it, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Maybe sign up for the newsletter. When you're all done checking stuff out on there or whistlekick.com, think about supporting us could be free, like leaving a review. Hey, these guys did some cool stuff. I appreciate it. Five stars, you know, whatever it is. Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Google, Spotify. You can't leave a review, but you can leave us some stars. We're doing well on Spotify. Leave us some stars. If you've got Spotify installed, please. You got to listen to 30 seconds, then you can do it. Want me to come out to your school and teach a seminar? I'd love to. I love meeting people. I love connecting with the listeners. So let's do that. Write to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. We'll find a day. Our social media is at whistlekick. If you've got topic or guest suggestions, you can email me. That's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.